one of the features of Advent in our church is the Advent reading. And I wanted to say a word to you today at the beginning of our service about uh, the Advent wreath that we use and what it means. Um, there's, there's nothing really sacred about an Advent wreath. Uh, there's no mention of such things in the scripture, and uh, in the earliest days of the church, they didn't exist. But through the Middle Ages, we developed ways to, uh, to help us uh, understand the progress of the Christian year. Uh, the Christian year begins with Advent and, of course, moves through Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter, and so on. Um, but at, uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, and, and the, the Christian year, by the way, um, uh, enables us to rehearse and relive the life of Jesus every year because the, the features of the Christian year, the, the seasons of the year, are uh, uh, the seasons of Jesus' life. In Advent, we are preparing for the coming of Jesus, for the birth of Jesus. And the Advent wreath is a means for us simply to mark the time and to see the progress of time as we move through it. In the Middle Ages, Advent was a season of fasting. And people would go without food or certain kinds of food during the Advent season to remind them of the importance of penitence and the importance of preparation. And so in Advent, there are four weeks. So there are four candles on the edge of the Advent wreath, um, and they are lit uh, on the four Sundays of Advent. The middle candle, the white one, is the Christ candle, and that is lit typically on Christmas Eve. Um, the season of Advent was a season of fasting, but in the middle of that season, um, uh, they took a break from the fasting in order to remind themselves that we're not preparing for something bad here, we're preparing for something joyful and good. So there was, a, there was a break in the fast right in the middle of it on the third Sunday in Advent. That's why the candle that we light on the third Sunday is pink. Um, it's, it's different because this is a different Sunday. The third Sunday in Advent was called Gaudet Sunday. Gaudet is a Latin word that means joy. Uh, so the third Sunday, the, the day that the uh, Sunday that we are all at right now, is Gaudet Sunday, the Sunday of joy. And so the candle is a different color to indicate that we are we are moving through a challenging season, but it is for joy and not for sorrow. And the end is coming. <laughs> the end is coming closer. So that's that's the Advent wreath. It's merely a way for us to mark to mark the time and to recognize our progress through the Advent season, the season of penitence and prayer that brings us to the birth of Jesus. Would you pray with me? We thank you, God, for the gift of time and for the time that you have given us uh, to live lives of generosity and faithfulness and hope and joy. Uh, help us to progress uh, as we live, to grow in these things, to grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, to grow in our understanding of how you are calling us to be your followers, your disciples, your servants. We use this, uh, this Advent wreath to help us remember and understand um, what the, the progress of time is about for us. Uh, so move with us through the time of our lives and through this season of our Christian year. Draw us ever closer to you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Good morning, Grace Church. I'm very excited to be here because we have with us many of our Brazilian students who have participated in the culture exchange in the past. Uh, why don't you go around and introduce yourselves? Hi, people, my brothers and sisters. I'm so happy to be here and talk with Shelly again. It is such a present um, talk with you guys again because for the first time I did in English because, uh, you know, I just touched English now a couple of years ago. Uh, I went there in 2016. It was a so nice time. So my name is Gabriel. I'm from the first group uh, of 2016. All right. <laughs> Yes, hi, I'm Amanda. I'm also from the same group. We actually met on the group <laughs> and on the trip, and Shelly is our matchmaker. <laughs> so we are. <laughs> and they will soon be getting married in the future. Yes. And you both live in Rio, right? We'll both yeah, live yeah. In Rio, we live yes. in Rio. Okay. Tatiana? I'm Tatiana. I live in Rio de Janeiro. I Participated 2016. And you'll remember her. You'll remember her because she played the organ for us and was doing a wonderful job at the organ. Hi, my name is Claudia. Uh, I'm living in Rio de Janeiro. I participated in 2019. Hi, my name is. Lívia, I live in Rio de Janeiro. I participated in 2018 and 2019. Great. Hello, everybody. I'm Jessica and I'm different. I'm living in Porto Velho. <laughs> and I participated at the first group in 2016. Hello everyone, my name is Gisele. I'm part participating uh, with the same group, Livia's group, in 2018 and 2019. All right, well, we're so happy to have all of you here with us today. Um, I know that you have made some t-shirts and you have a name called Grace Handbells. Uh, Tatiana, can you stand up so we can see your t-shirt? Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, Amanda, tell us a little bit about that t-shirt. Hi, so we, we've made the t-shirt for our group that we decided to call Grace Handbells Group because the bells that we have right now here in Rio uh, were donated from people from Grace uh, Church and then we decided to pay our tribute to the church and name our group after the church so we decided to call it Grace Handbells Group. All right, so we had first um, tongue chimes that were donated by the Snyder family. So we first were called Snyder Chimes Group, as attributed yeah, yeah. them. And then <clears throat> once we received the handbells, um, then we decided to change to Grace, um, since other people in the church also helped us have the handbells here in Brazil. Well, that's so wonderful for us at Grace, because we are able to be involved with your mission and your projects, and we really appreciate the fact that you have Grace Handbells and being part of your mission that makes us excited. Uh, so tell us a little bit about some of the concerts that you have already done. I believe you went to Puerto Vallejo, right? Yes, last year we went to Puerto Vallejo. We brought the, the handbells back to Brazil in the middle of last year, like around July. And then we were already able to go to Porto Velho, which is a city far away from here, near the Amazon, uh, where Jessica lives. And we were able to go there and play a concert um, for people there, and everyone loved. It was, I believe, for most people, the first time they've seen uh, the instruments, so it was very good. And we got to play with her orchestra there, too. Bells and orchestra, it was very, very good. Yes, and, and I believe that you gave a lot of joy to the people in the Amazon forest who are, or live near the Amazon and were having the fires at that time. So we really yeah. appreciate the fact that you were sharing the bells and having your own mission projects. Uh, you have a few other mission or projects that you're doing with the bells, right? Uh, does 
uh, our tone chimes. I believe Livia is doing something, right? Livia? É, eu comecei em 2017 com um projeto de musicalização aqui na minha igreja para as crianças da igreja. So she started in 2017 teaching music to the children from her church. Onde eu trabalho com os tunchines e com flautas, boomwackers, é, coral, enfim, várias áreas da musicalização infantil. And then on her project, uh, she uses recorders, uh, tone chimes, boom whackers, things that she learned when she was uh, in the States. So she uses it with her kids in her project. That's awesome. And I believe too that the Grace Church helped to provide some tone chimes for Porto Velho. What are you doing with those tone chimes now, Jessica? So we use it, the, the tone chimes in my school with the kids. And we also use the boom workers first for the little kids and use the tone chimes with the kids with 10 years old. And we can play too with the orchestra, some music. So it's very interesting. Oh, that's wonderful. So you have uh, some concerts that you've done in the past. You have some projects with children that you're doing with the tone chimes and the bells. And I believe that the, the pandemia has played a, a little bit of a difficulty for you and slowed things down, right? Did you have some issues with that? Yes, of course. Like we were planning to start our project, we go, go to schools, to churches and play the bells, but unfortunately we cannot with the pandemic. So we find our way, uh, we find our way during the online uh, virtual handbell choir. Uh, and we don't have the handbells at everyone's house, but at least we have tone chimes, which allow us to play. And then you get to see a little bit of that today too. Wonderful. And uh, at this Christmas season, I think we're all trying to figure out what can we do? What can we buy for those people who really have everything? And I have a little of an idea for those at Grace Church. Uh, we can help to support uh, these young people in their projects. Uh, we have tone chimes and handbells in Rio de Janeiro, but we do not have uh, handbells right now in Sao Paulo. They're using some very old handbells that are falling apart. And I'm very excited because the Snyder family has recently um, donated $3,000 to go toward buying some handbells in uh, Sao Paulo. Uh, we also have a donation of $2,000, which brings us to five. So we need uh, several thousand more yet to, to get that project. So if you are at Grace are looking for something to get for a Christmas present in honor of someone, I would encourage you to help give a little bit so that we can make uh, handbells go around the world and to continue these projects and supporting these wonderful young people. And uh, we're so excited to have all of you here. It makes me so excited to be with you. So thank you.
A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 and 8 through 11. In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of the people dull, and stop their ears, and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn, and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, and houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from Psalm 126. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we rejoiced. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the watercourses and the Negeb. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On the third Sunday in Advent, we turn to uh, the first chapter of John's Gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know. The one who is coming after me, I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Today I want to ask you one of my favorite riddles. Perhaps you've heard it before, it's not difficult. How many sides does a house have? Any house, every house, they're all the same. Doesn't matter whether it's large or small. All houses have the same number of sides. The answer, of course, is two. Every house has two sides an inside, and an outside. And if you look around us, there that's true of so many things. How many sides does a coin have? A coin has two sides. 
the heads and the tails. How many sides does a life have? Well, it could be said that a life has two sides too, the inside and the outside. The, the, the physical part that we see and, and uh, struggle with every day and the spiritual part, the inner part that we don't see as much. There are, there are lots of, of entities in our life and in our world that are two-sided. Um, the, sides, the sides of a house, for example, are, are of equal significance and equal size. The, the outside of a house will tell you the size of the inside. Um, um, but we know a great deal more about the outside of things. We talk about them more. We deal with them more than we do the insides. We know a great deal more about the outside of our life than we do of the inside. We've been in the midst of this COVID uh, pandemic for many months, and we're talking about how to deal with it and, and uh, awaiting the, the vaccines which, which, are, which are coming. We are right at the threshold of having vaccines to treat it. But all of that is about the outside of our life, the physical side of our life. We spend precious little time talking about, thinking about, working with the inner part of ourselves, the inner part of our, of our lives. Well, in the same way, in the same way, the gospel has two sides, two, uh, uh, an, an inside and an outside, you could say. But just like with our lives and the inside and outside of our lives, we are... Um, most familiar with only one side of the gospel. And this morning, the, the lesson forces us to look at the other side of the gospel. The gospel has two sides. They're approximately the same size. One tells us a great deal about the other. But the side of the gospel that we are most familiar with is the side called, called love. The gospel is about love. God's love for us and how God expresses our love. God expresses God's love for us. Love's story is well known. For out of love for us, God made us in our world. Out of love for us, God sent Jesus, whose birth we prepare to celebrate. Out of love for us, God raised Jesus from death. Out of love for us, God makes God makes God's self vulnerable to us despite our sin. God speaks to us. God seeks us. God saves us. All of this because God is love. We know that side of the gospel. We are deeply acquainted with that side of it. But if we know only the story of love in these ways, we only know half of it. Because there's another side to the gospel. And its name is justice. Has the word of love shouted so loud that we've become deaf to the voice of justice. Indeed, justice is one of love's expressions. And so they are not entirely separate, just like the inside and outside of a house are not separate. They have a great deal to do with one another. But the gospel has two sides, love and justice. Consider again the, the words of Isaiah in chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives and release for prisoners, to proclaim, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow upon them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. For I, the Lord, love justice. Those, those are not love words or love promises, but here is a voice that is crying out for justice. Justice. Good news to the poor. Binding up the brokenhearted, freedom for captives, release for prisoners. Those are justice words, not love words. When the Pharisees sent to inquire of John in the desert, 
He did not respond to them with words of love, but with a demand for just living. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, he said. Straighten yourselves up because the Lord is coming your way. Straighten yourselves up. Get your lives in order. I baptize you with water. You better watch out for the one who's coming after me. His baptism will be harder to bear. His demands, his expectations for you are far more so, more stringent than mine are. You see, whenever the word of love is spoken by the gospel, there is joy and celebration and happiness and liberty. But the other half of the gospel is never far away. And when the word of justice is spoken, there is big trouble because God's call for justice is not soothing, but it shakes us up. It does not confirm our sensibilities and comfort us, but it challenges us. It does not identify with us, but rejects our selfishness. God's justice will undo us if we do not respond to its call. Every year in, uh, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, there is displayed uh, beneath the great Christmas tree there, there's displayed a beautiful 18th century Neapolitan nativity scene. And in, in so many ways, it's a very uh, familiar scene. The usual characters are all there. Uh, uh, shepherds uh, roused from their sleep by the voices of the angels, the exotic magi from the east, Mary and Joseph and the baby, all there, each figure an artistic marvel of, of wood and clay and paint. It's a, it's a beautiful scene. But there's something surprising about that nativity scene, something unexpected. And if, if you're just observing it casually, you'll miss it. What is strange there is that the stable and the shepherds and the manger are not set in the expected small town of Bethlehem. But they are sitting there among the ruins of mighty Roman columns. The fragile manger is surrounded by, by broken and decaying columns. The artist knew the meaning of the treasure, the gospel. God's word of love and justice meant the death of the old world and the death of our old ways. For you see, there was that scene of love set in there at the Metropolitan Museum. There is that scene of love set in the midst of the call for justice, giving up our old ways and adopting and adapting to God's new ways, God's call for justice. We know even now that the romantic and beautiful events recorded at the nativity are only a prelude to big trouble. You remember the gospel story, how it happened. This, this uh, John the baptizer, from whom we heard this morning, will soon meet an untimely death. And Jesus himself will be challenged by those same Pharisees and die a tortured death at the hands of the Romans. Quite a different outcome than we expect after such a tender and promising beginning at Christmas. All of this because Jesus spoke of God's love? No, not at all. All of this because Jesus demanded that the people of God hear God's word of justice too. It was the, it was the Old Testament prophets, Amos and Micah, who were quoted by Martin Luther King Jr. Do you remember? I still have a dream today that one day justice will roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. I still have a dream today that in all our state houses and city halls, people will be elected to go there who will justly, who will do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with their God. This is God's call too. God's call, God calls us 
to love as God is love. But God calls us to love justice as God loves justice too. There are two sides of the gospel. God's call to love and God's call to justice. Love, love is, after all, so easily perverted. It can be held and kept all for ourselves, a loving community, a loving family, a loving club. But the other side of the gospel demands an outward expression, an other directedness, a greater concern that can be expressed only in our own family. I should say it this way, a greater concern than can be expressed just in our own family, our own community. God's call for justice pushes us outside ourselves into our world where we must be activists. We must be risk takers, challenging the status quo for much of the maladjustment, the wrong that we see in our world caused by a lack of justice. This is what we've been hearing in recent months as our attention has been called to the, uh, the realities of racism in our culture and the ways that it has gone underground, that it can still live even, even at times when we profess to be loving, to be colorblind, to be uninterested and, and not invested in the ways of racism. Still it lingers there. Still it is, it is uh, hiding out in us and in our actions, and in our beliefs, and, and in our actions. Still it is there, and we must work hard to ferret it out, to recognize it, to acknowledge it, and to let go of it. Millions of Christians have been inspired by the life and death of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and theologian who was killed in, uh, during World War II, Bonhoeffer was outspoken concerning the sins of Adolf Hitler, just as John the Baptist was outspoken about the sins of Herod. Friends in the United States and England, knowing the probable consequences of opposing Hitler, arranged for Bonhoeffer to leave Germany. And he did so. He came to the United States. But after a few months, he recognized that he had to return to his homeland. For he said, he said, if I do not live there now with my people while they are suffering, I will have no right to speak to them and to lead them when the suffering is over. So he went home and he preached ever more strongly against what was happening in his country and to his people. And by doing so, he aroused great opposition. He was forced to go underground. But later he was imprisoned. And there he was executed um, just before the Allies liberated the town and the prison where he was held. Out of his struggles, Bonhoeffer wrote the monumental work, The Cost of Discipleship. It stands as an eternal judgment on those who want Christ but do not want to bear a cross, who want to, who want to claim the love of Jesus but who do not want to live the justice he demands from us. John the Baptist, John the baptizer, understood the cost of discipleship. He knew what it was to sacrifice himself in answer to God's call. God's word of love affirms and accepts us. But God's word of justice calls us to action. If we are, and we, if we are to be God's people, we must hear and respond to both sides of the gospel, accepting the joy of love with its affirmation and acceptance, but also accepting the sacrifices that justice requires with its judgment and its unrelenting demands. How many sides does a house have? Two sides, inside and outside. The gospel is like that too. It has two sides, love and justice. 
It is only when we hear both words that we have heard the good news which Jesus brought us in its entirety. It is only when we respond to both love and justice that we become fully the people of God and disciples of Jesus. Amen.